So I'm going to go ahead and tune and play, and then I'll talk more about what is happening. <laughs> so if you don't know what's happening, you'll find out eventually. <laughs> It's very, very weird and very rare when you start up the pipes and they're in tune. Thank you. Um, so uh, these pipes are quite old. In fact, I think they might be older than everyone here. Um, they were made sometime between 1750 and 1800s. So, uh, and I was lucky enough to get them in uh, just before the pandemic in uh, uh, December of 2019. Um, and so during the pandemic, I had a lot of time in my hands. Uh, so I recorded a CD, and that was smart because I released or finished the CD. It came out in 2020, and 
the pandemic did not end. So I didn't do any CD release parties or anything until now. So this is the first one. So it's been out for a bit, but I figured I might as well finally do something. <laughs> so that, um, so uh, the album is interesting. It's, it's, an, it's called Good Enough Music for Them Who Love It, which is a quote uh, from a, a general in the Scottish army uh, who was writing about military strategy and other things in the 1600s. And he said that bagpipes are good enough music for them who love it, but they're not as good as the flute or the fife. Uh, and any company that wants to have a bagpiper can have a bagpiper, but they'll get no money to keep the bagpiper, which is as much as they deserve. <laughs> so yeah, figured that was a pretty good title for an album. <laughs> uh, and that, that uh, jig I just played is called Daniel the Sun. Um, it's the second tune in a collection of music, which I'm going to play a lot of music from, uh, which is a great, it's actually the best title of a collection of music ever. Uh, the title is O'Farrell's Pocket Companion for the Irish or Union Pipes, being a grand selection of tunes, both Scotch and Irish, suitable for the violin, flute, and flageolet. <laughs> and the last word there is a fancy word for a tin whistle, but flageolet, it's great. Great little word. Um, sounds like it should be the pipes, actually, because you know, a little bit of flatulence going on. Um, I'm going to continue on with uh, some slip jigs that all... Um, no, they don't all come from O'Farrell's. The first one comes out of O'Farrell's as well, and uh, it's called The Drought. Uh, it's also known as Drown Drought, so you might understand that that means drink, half a pint. So The Drought is what you have when you don't have a beer. Uh, and then I'm going to go on from... Uh, afterwards, I'm going to play another uh, slip jig called The Irish Hop Pickers, um, which I guess... Works, I didn't actually think about it till just this moment. There's a theme there, the drought and the hot pickers. Uh, and then the last one uh, is called Next Oars. I don't know why. Uh, or the, the Sheep Shearers. So nothing to do with drinking. <laughs>
Now I'm going to use the plugs. So um, one of the things I discovered with a set of pipes, which is really fun, so there's four drones. Anyone who knows pipes knows that uh, Irish pipes usually only have three drones. These ones have four. Um, so there's a bass, a baritone, and a tenor, like normal. But there's also this extra fourth drone, which is an A. Uh, and so I discovered kind of um, one time randomly, because I was having fun, I discovered that if I use a nice little piece of string and tie open this one regulator note and use only the A drone and the bass drone, I can have a nice, quiet, pretend Highland pipes. So I'm going to play a... Um, Something that was probably played on the big pipes, uh, but the Irish version of the Highland pipes rather than the Scottish pipes. Uh, and it's, it's a piece, uh, it's a jig, but I think it's also a march, so I call them jig marches. I should, have, uh, should have told you that you were supposed to count the triplets in that one. So you, can, you can listen now and just think about what you heard and try to count as many triplets as you can. Um, I'm going to finish off with a set of reels, and then we're going to take a break. And we're going to come back after a break. So if you need a drink, uh, I don't think they're serving here, but maybe there's... They are serving here. So there is beer. Perfect. It'll be even better in the second half. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to take one, one last thing. I'm going to play three reels. Uh, the first one comes from O'Farrell's again. Uh, again, most things in the f this half... Actually, most things I'm playing tonight come from, come from O'Farrell's. Um, and it, there's very, it's a very interesting because reels were not a thing. They really weren't a thing in Irish music when these pipes were being made and when they were being played. So um, there's only a handful of reels in O'Farrell's, and the first two are not amongst those. So I actually took a tune that's in like 
two for. It's probably supposed to be like a weird march. And I was like, that could be a reel. I'll make it a reel. It's good. And then I took another one that was in also in two four, but was like maybe like a polka. And I was like, yeah, I can make that a reel. I'll make that a reel. It'll be good. And then I found the last one in a Scottish collection because that's kind of where reels come from. They're really Scottish. We like them a lot in Irish music, and we do a really good job of them now. Um, but it took a while. It took a couple hundred years to get there. <laughs> so I, I took this one out of a Scottish collection around the same time. Uh, James aired. It was published in Glasgow. Um, and it I've never heard it played anywhere else. I've never really seen it anywhere else. But it's a great tune, and it's called The Merry Lads of Foss. And I don't know where Foss is. I think it's in Scotland. But if you know where it is, um, you can draw a map, and you can give it to me, but preferably on a dollar bill, like a hundred dollar bill would be great. So, perfect. <laughs> These are also on the album. There's been a few things I've played that have been on the album. The last one was, this one is, the first one was, the second one was, I think nothing else. So, but if you like those, and there's things I'm not playing tonight, so if you like what I'm doing and you want to take me home with you, it will take a lot of money or you can buy a CD. <laughs> right, I should undo that regulator. <laughs> there we go. That'll be better. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, so take a little break, have a drink. I'll be back in a few minutes. All right, everybody, we are going to...
wrap up our intermission and continue on with this fabulous uh, display of Illin Piping in honor of International Illin Piping Day. So this is actually Nicholas's third time playing at the Folk Point. It is his first solo show, so that's very exciting. Although he won't be solo the entire time during this upcoming set, as you will soon see. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to think of this show as sort of Nick's baptism as a St. Louis and he moved here last January and we're very glad and he chose to move to St. Louis because of the strong Irish music scene and all the support that you guys provide to make it a strong music scene so uh, it, was, it was just for the park <laughs> well and for Tower Grove Park that, that was what sealed the deal <laughs> but also all of you and all the all the appreciation for music that exists here. So we are very lucky to be in such a cool city. If you're into the whole Ellen Piping thing, there's a big festival in St. Louis every April called the St. Louis Chanel. And that's just a wonderful weekend of amazing music and classes. You can learn how to do it yourself. You can learn other instruments as well. Mike Mullins is back there. If you want to talk to him all about it, he'll tell you anything you need to do know about the St. Louis Ellen Piping scene. Um, okay, and I'm going to stop talking now and welcome Nick back onto the stage. Give him a big round of applause. Thank you. I'm going to do the same thing I did before and play something and then talk about it. In tune, apparently.
Thank you. Um, those are uh, two more jig marches, I guess. Uh, jigs or marches or both. Uh, and the first one is not commonly called O'Sullivan's these days, but it's in an old collection and it's played in, in Scottish music too as a rock and a wee pickle toe. Which I love the name. <laughs> And then the second one, uh, I found it originally as a two-part tune in an old collection uh, as the Taylor's March, as in, you know, a march for the people who make clothing for their club. They had, like, their club march, which is really cool. Uh, but I found a four-part version of it in an older collection with a much better name. It's called Beware of the Ripples. <laughs> I don't know what ripples are, but hey, beware of them. Um, so, okay, so on the break, Rob told me that I should explain this instrument and how it works. So I'm going to do that really quick. Uh, so these are pipes. Everyone knows how they work. We're done. Perfect. <laughs> so uh, um, these are Irish pipes. Unlike the Highland pipes, I don't have to blow into them. You might have noticed that I'm not blowing into them at all. You might not have noticed that. Now is your chance to notice. Uh, on the right here, I have a bellows. Um, this is a fireplace bellows. I just actually use it for my fire at home. That's a lie. Uh, but it is very similar. And uh, the air goes in the hole here and feeds across my belly in a tube to the bag. The bag is what makes them bagpipes. And then that feeds into the pipes, which is what makes them the other part of bagpipes. Uh, and so these pipes are seven. Actually, this also has an extra drone. So there's eight pipes. Uh, the main one is the melody maker, or the singer, or in French, the chante, or the chanter. That's what we call it in English, is the chanter, but it does come from the French. And unlike the Highland Pipes, I have two octaves. Uh, and even higher, if I can really make it work. I never use that note. Rob would hate me. Rob would tell me to go back home somewhere else. <laughs> um, and then we've got drones. That's the thing making the constant buzzing noise. It's actually, John is doing a great job on sound. It's not his fault, it's not feedback. Um, and then we have these three things that I keep hitting with my hand. These are called regulators, but actually, in O'Farrell's, uh, they were not called regulators. It was called the Pupolo. And I, I far prefer Pupolo. I mean, I wanted to play my Pupolo all day long. Okay, that actually just sounds bad. Uh, so that's how they work. One other cool thing, uh, I have this nice piece of leather that I purchased at Joanne Fabrics. You might have heard of it. It's a very old store. <laughs> uh, and that lets me seal the chanter. So unlike the Highland Pipes, I can actually have space and silence and quietness, unlike the Highland Pipes, which are loud and constant. I love the Highland Pipes, but I'm definitely going to talk crap about them. Um, <laughs> I'm going to continue on with some hop jigs because they're my favorite tune type of all time. So I mentioned that I learned that air in the first half right before the pandemic. Well, I learned this first hop jig right before the pandemic too. I had no idea it was coming. I just thought this was a great tune. It's called Sick and Very Bad. <laughs> I really feel like it's my fault. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm going to follow that up with two versions of the same thing. Uh, it's a, an old tune called Bob and Joan, or Love and Whiskey, uh, which I did record another version of it on a, a CD, not my solo CD, but an earlier CD that is back there. Um, so these are two new versions of it that I also play. And then I'm going to finish it off with a fourth tune, because I'm kind of insane, and that's a lot of, a lot of things to try to play, called uh, Gang to the Kirk or Going to the Church. Um, and both the last two tunes are actually three two hornpipes that I turned into hop jigs. Uh, and if you want to know more about that, uh, I don't have time tonight. It's, it'll take me a couple hours to explain because I'm really nerdy and I won't stop talking. <laughs>
So now, I'm not going to torture you with solo Ellen Pipes anymore. I'm going to get Eileen to come up here and join me on the harp. Uh, I'm going to play, uh, think, yes, please applaud, <laughs> please clap. <laughs> um, so I mentioned a lot about O'Farrell. O'Farrell was a piper, uh, and he was a piper who played probably this very set of pipes. Oh, that's a lie. <laughs> I, wish, I wish that were true, but he played a set of pipes very similar to this. And uh, he also was famous for playing in a pantomime, uh, or a, a beggar's opera type thing, um, in London in the late 1700s called Oscar and Mulvina. Oscar and Mulvina was supposedly collected by James McPherson, I have to check here, um, from the blind bard Ocean, or Ocean, uh, who, I, I totally butchered that, sorry. Um, Rob's just making fun of me now. I heard him whisper back there. <laughs> I have no idea. Um, uh, it's completely made up. So James McPherson just totally made up this fake bard, made up the whole mythology, and just copied it from the Irish. Why not? They're the best. <laughs> um, but it does make for a very interesting play and interesting music. So I'm gonna play, um, I'm gonna play the next three things come from Oscar Mulvina, from the, the pantomime or the stage performance uh, that O'Farrell would have played. He would have played all of this music with a harp player in London. Um, I did not get a harp player for my album because it was the pandemic and we were completely locked down. So this is the first time that these have been performed on the set of pipes by this piper with a harp player. We're going to start, uh, I will explain, I'm not going to just play all three pieces without ex explanation. So the first thing we're going to start with is the overture, um, and it's another kind of descriptive piece, or at least a piece. Um, so there's different movements, different rhythms, and so forth. So the overture from Oscar Molvina. Just make sure that I'm in tune. And also using the plugs to silence a couple drones. So these are very interesting pipes because they are very old and yet somehow they are almost in A440. Almost. So she is being very patient with me. <laughs>
Thank you. At this point, members of the cast of Oscar and Mavino would sing songs and do other things and have little dances and so forth. And um, there'd be some narrative storytelling with the dancing and the singing and all sorts of things. And suddenly there'd be a battle. So that's what we're going to play next, is the battle. I don't really understand how it gets from the overture to the battle. I, I probably should know that, but I don't. So we're going to get to the battle just magically. Um, so this is another descriptive piece, kind of like what I played in the first half, uh, the battle from Oscar Malvina. It, is, um, it starts with a, a kind of a hound march, which signifies the various armies marching into formation and into the field. Then it starts, uh, then, then it has a, um, a battle, or sorry, a, a march to the battle. So there's the Highland march of marching into the area, then a march that they're actually starting to fight. And then I'm going to make some fighting noises. And there's a lot of chaos in a battle, so you might hear a lot of chaos on the pipes. And, uh, and then um, the battle ends with the death of the chieftain. So I'm going to lament the chieftain just like I lamented the fox. And then we're going to end with a retreat march away from the battle. And that's the end of the battle. All right. <laughs> Thank you. 
We're gonna play one last uh, one last piece from Oscar Molina. These are a couple dances which may have taken place before the battle or after the battle. I don't know. Uh, we're gonna put them together anyway and play them as a set, which is very unusual for the time. So a quick step and a dance from Oscar Molina. Don't have any other name or any other information for you for those. <laughs> you can think of this as the party after the battle. <laughs>
thank you. And thank you, Eileen. Uh, um, I'm going to kick her off stage now. Go away, Eileen. <laughs> and uh, invite Rob up. Uh, because Eileen was gracious enough to tune her harp a little bit flat for this set, but she's not going to tune it flat enough for that set. But Rob did, because he's a really good guy. <laughs> <laughs> also, I made him. He only, uh, he only asked me to, to play in B, because I'm so... I always complain about how long it takes for harps and pipes to tune. And of course, if you tune your fiddle down two steps, it doesn't like staying in tune. So this is, his, this is the piper's revenge. It's going to take him longer to tune than it'll take me. remarkably stable and um, for the musicians in the room they are at 431 I don't know why um, we're gonna play a couple reels when we're done tuning <laughs> we're gonna play two reels um, which are not Irish because again there's very few Irish reels from this time period uh, when I the week that I moved to uh, st. Louis um, there's a banjo player really nice banjo player named Alan Reed who's been as nerdy about learning tunes from tune books as I am, which is saying a lot. He's actually might be more nerdy, which is crazy. Um, and uh, he's been putting up a, a video every Tuesday, uh, tune, book tunes, tune Book Tuesday. And the week I moved, he put up this first reel. And it was so good, I had to steal it. And so I, I play it now. Uh, you might hear it on Wednesday nights, because uh, I play over at Riley's, and I often play it there. And then the second one is a great tune called The Lily. And when we're done playing, I'll explain what I think it's a version of, but I don't want to screw Rob up, so I haven't told him yet. Uh, so Johnny Ladd and the Lily. <laughs> Thank you. 
a little bit too fast. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for being here and listening to me play a lot of really nerdy and esoteric music. Uh, I appreciate it. If you liked it, buy a CD. If you didn't like it, buy a CD in any way. Uh, just it'd be nice. I have a lot of them, and I'd like to get rid of them. Um, we're going to finish up with a last set of tunes. These are, um, these are both from O'Farrell's. Uh, so the first one is Helvick Head, and it's on page 28 in volume one. And the second one is A Trip to Clarny, and it's on page eight in O'Farrell's volume one. But they're also really common session tunes. So I'm not the first person, and I won't be the last person to steal tunes out of O'Farrell's. Um, these were recorded back in the 90s by a really excellent group called Fisher Street, and that's basically where we both learned them from. So we're going to play them, even though they're common tunes, they're still awesome. <laughs> they're not that common. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Have a Nick, great night. Nick Brown, everybody. I'm gonna smack the mic a couple more times and play one more tune. Um, there's a uh, there's a very common piping piece, piping reel. Um, it's also played by fiddlers, which is not as cool. <laughs> the fiddlers will tell you it's a fiddle tune, and the pipers will tell you it's a pipe tune. Um, it's called Rakish Patty. So I'm gonna play that. It's not that old, but it's a version of a tune that comes from the era where that, those pipes come from. Uh, and it's in O'Farrell's called uh, Caberfay, or, or um, O'Farrell was great for not having any idea what Gaelic was supposed to look like, so he called it Caperfay. Well, I guess happy capers or something. Um, and uh, it means the, the deer's horn. So I'm going to play both those things, <laughs> Rakish Paddy and uh, Caberfay. Thank you. <laughs> and that really is it, so go home. <laughs> <laughs>